So now we come to democracy and the first thing that struck me about it was the interesting discussion we just had this morning uh, with uh, uh, Emil and Gorin uh, uh, at the level of the nation state about the subjective and objective dimensions of this. Uh, and uh, we have the same thing with democracy because there's been a tendency, especially in the West, to uh, our topic really is uh, what is the, the role of democracy or what is the relationship between democracy and global governance? And this is profound issues which we know we're not going to settle in the next 40 minutes. Uh, but I think it's interesting uh, to see the parallel here that uh, uh, as the nation state has a fundamental cultural base to its identity and an institutional structure uh, that defines it and how it operates, the same is true of democracy. And uh, 20 years ago, some of you are, I'm sure, familiar with Fareed Zakaria's book on the future of democracy. He was the one, I think he was the one who coined uh, the phrase illiberal democracy originally. Uh, and had a whole chapter on it because democracy as a system arose from a, a culture, a, the culture of liberalism, of individualism and individual rights in Europe. The system of democracy, the institutions came much later. We had liberal values and the rights of the individual centuries before we had elected parliaments. Uh, so the institutions came as an expression of cultural values. Uh, now we have seen over the last 50 years efforts of, of the West to transfer and impose the institutions of democracy to countries that didn't have the, the culture. Uh, and we see uh, the problems that it has generated. We have democracies electing uh, uh, the uh, uh, religious uh, leaders to run to run by a theocracy or uh, all different versions we've had uh, elect military leaders to reinstall uh, autocracy whatever it may be so this same pattern is there uh, and it probably shouldn't be surprising because that's there in our thinking our thinking has been uh, in the social sciences to such a large extent objective and mechanistic and leaving out the essential interrelationship between the subjective and objective that we have mistaken what we need to do. And the fact that we're now coming to look at a, a, a economy in terms of human beings uh, <laughs> rather than uh, uh, GDP or uh, our territory, but we're really realizing, and it came out beautifully, I can't remember who emphasized it, but it came out beautifully in the last session, that the real precious creative force is the human being. Uh, so we're coming full circle to kind of bring these two back together. Uh, and we need a theory that does that as well. Uh, one uh, a lot of our work with relation to governance and especially democracy has been focusing on the issue of power, uh, social power. What we've seen is that the society over centuries is more powerful than it's ever been before. And power, the way we use it, has a specific connotation, but I mean it in the most general sense, the way we talk about it in physics, the capacity to do work. The society, global society today has a capacity that human beings have never had before, whether it's the society for capacity for communication or transportation or education or research or production or distribution for everything. Uh, but we have to have a word to distinguish our capacity for accomplishment from the way we utilize that capacity, and that's the word power, the way power is normally used. Uh, uh, we, there's a difference between the increasing capacity and the distribution of that capacity, or the distribution of the benefits of that capacity. 
And we've been running a program in the, in the academy for the last five years on what we call social power, where we're looking at how society increases its capacity, but also how it uses the fruits and, tr and distributes the fruits of that capacity or the control of that capacity. Uh, and it was interesting to see in the last World Bank report on governance and law, uh, I, uh, it's the first time it stood out for me, it may be there earlier, but they dedicated a whole section of the report to the misuse of power as a critical determinant of social outcomes in the society. Of course, we've been talking about corruption for a long time, but they began to see that it permeates everything. And that's what we have discovered. It, dis it permeates everything that we're talking about at the local level, at the individual level, and at the global level as well. So we've come to the conclusion that we really need to look at this dimension of every issue. Today, our real topic is what's the relationship between democracy and global governance? Well, uh, at one level, what's the relationship between democracy at the national level and governance of any type at the global level? Because uh, we know and we see how susceptible our populations are now to please that the problem is we're seceding sovereignty, we're seceding power to a global entity or to a regional entity. Brexit is an example. Uh, Trump is, is saying something too. So these are profound questions we're not going to uh, answer today. Uh, it, it, to what extent is a democratic system, which is by the a system that distributes power more effectively than any system we've had up until now, but to what extent is it conducive to the evolution of global society when local populations are so susceptible to the polarizing uh, uh, perspectives of political parties that would rather divide and conquer than really do what's good for the nation. And then we've got the issue of global of democracy at the global level, and to what extent, as we uh, globalize, will we be able to create institutions that are really democratic, when in fact the principal obstacle will not just be one nation state over the other, but nation states as governments, I mean, uh, not just as the people, uh, are somewhat reluctant to cede authority to their own people, a real voice to their people. Uh, today, uh, we have something called uh, uh, sovereignty, but it's really practiced by national governments uh, who don't even, in most cases, take in fully into account the, vo the, the wishes of their own people. <coughs> today, we don't have anything like uh, a, a practical concept of human sovereignty. What about human beings? All of us as humanity. We have no direct voice in the governance of the world. We have to go through nation states, and I think most of us feel our national governments don't really reflect our intentions or our uh, values at all. Then where is the question when national governments are getting together uh, and competing with each other for their own uh, reasons and and the hum and the individual doesn't have a voice, uh, an effective voice at all. Uh, it's a big, big discussion. So, uh, I think we've raised this raises enough questions, many more than we can answer. But it the intention is to open a discussion and suggest that this is a much bigger topic that we have a lot of work to do on.